ध्याय ध्याय प्रभुपाद 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 ध्याय ध्याय प्रभुपा हे ध्याय ध्याय प्रभुपाद प्रभुपाद हे प्रभुपाद ध्याय ध्याय प्रभुपा ಪ್ರಭುಪಾ ಅವತಾರ ಮಯ ದೃಷ್ಟ ರಾಮಮನಸ್ಯಗುಣ ಸೋಹಂ ತಂ ದ್ರಾಸ್ತು ಇಚ್ಛಾ ಯಥೇಯೋಷಿಡ್ವಪೂರ್ ದೃಷ್ಟ ಅವತಾರ ಮಯ ದೃಷ್ಟ ರಾಮಮಾನಸ್ಯಗುಣ ಸೋಹಂ ತಂ ದ್ರಾಸ್ತು ಇಚ್ಛಾ ಯಥೇಯೋಷಡ್ವಪೂರ್ ದೃಷ್ಟ ಅವತಾರ ಮಯ ದೃಷ್ಟ ರಾಮಮಾನಸ್ಯಗುಣ ಸೋಹಂ ತಂ ದ್ರಾಸ್ತು ಇಚ್ಛಾ ಯಥೇಯೋಷಿಡ್ವಪೂರ್ಧ avatara incarnations maya by me drishta have been seen have been seen ramavanasya while you demonstrate your various pastimes te of you gunai by the manifestations of transcendental qualities sa lord shiva aham i tat that incarnation drastum its chami wish to see yat which te of you yosit vapu 
the body of a woman, Dritam, was accepted. So Lord Shiva is speaking to Lord Vishnu, and Lord Vishnu is asking him why he's come, and he's giving his reason now. My Lord, I have seen all kinds of incarnations you have exhibited by your transcendental qualities, and now that you have appeared as a beautiful young woman, I wish to see that form of your Lordship. Hmm. Purport. When Lord Shiva approached Lord Vishnu, Lord Vishnu inquired about the purpose of Lord Shiva coming there. Now Lord Shiva discloses his desire. He wanted to see the recent incarnation of Mohini Murti, which Lord Vishnu had assumed to distribute the nectar generated from the churning of the ocean of milk. Hmm. Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Vacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine Vanchakalpa Tiru Bischa Kripa Sindhu Rie Bacha Paditanam Pabane Bio Vaishnave Bio Namaho Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Priya Daita Gadad Harsi Vasidi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Hari Rama, Hari Rama, 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 Hari Hari. Hmm. We can look at this from from Shiva's point of view from two points. That the great souls always want to experience each and every incarnation of the Lord. And in another way, he is not understanding what is about to happen. Now both of them are seems to be conflicting here. <laughs> curiosity. Well, that curiosity is transcendental because all of the forms of the Lord are what we say attractive, powerful, and exhibit certain characteristics and qualities. Mm -hmm. What is that verse? Uh, okay. From the Brahma Samhita. Angani yasya akalans riti manti pasyanti panti chiranda ganti ananda chinmayo asvadu govinda mari purusham tamaham bhajami. That's not the verse, there's another verse. Where one candle lights up another candle, and then that candle lights up another candle, and that candle is lights up another candle. So you can see that all of the candle have the same candle power, but the original candle is the source of all the candles. So Krishna is the original source of all manifestations and incarnations, but he has innumerable and uncountable, they even say unlimited, manifestations of his forms, and each one of them is equally powerful, but they don't exhibit the power of the original candle. They exhibit according to their particular uh, manifestation. There's a purpose for why the Lord appears in a certain form. There's a mission, there's a purpose. There's something he wants to accomplish, there's something he wants to exhibit. So when he appeared as Mohini Murti, he wanted to bewilder the demons. The demons are attracted to the beautiful forms of the opposite sex, and they become infatuated by that. And this is their na that's the nature of a demon. A demon is full of qualities that are of the material nature, lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, envy. Uh, uh, what else? And did I miss one? Well, there's six qualities, yeah. Six qualities, so this lusty desire to fulfill one's uh, desires for sensual enjoyment 
comes in the form of the attraction of the opposite sex. That's one form of that lusty desire. So in order to get the demons <clears throat> to uh, give up their nectar, uh, the Lord, because they had stolen the nectar from the demigods, and they wanted to take it for themselves. So Krishna, siding with the demigods in this particular case, sometimes he's neutral, and sometimes he sides with the demigods. In this case, he sided with the demigods because the demigods came to him for help. And therefore, he uh, manifested himself in this beautiful form of Mohini Murti. Krishna is already attractive. And Prabhupada always says the female form is even more attractive than the male form. So when you imagine when Krishna takes a female form, Haribo. <laughs> Don't imagine. <laughs> Shiva imagined that he got in trouble. And so in that particular form, he simply bewildered the demons. And whatever the Mohini Murti said, because they became enchanted by this transcendental form, that uh, whatever she said, they were willing to do. <laughs> so she just said, give me the pot of nectar. And they did. They trusted her because, for whatever reason, they say you shouldn't trust a woman. But anyway, <laughs> well, that's another thing. But that's that's not uh, not a Krishna conscious woman. A Krishna conscious woman can be trusted. But somebody who's materialist, like it says, never trust a politician or a woman. There's a, there's a statement like that because they have an agenda. What is that agenda? They don't tell you until it happens. <laughs> then it's too late. But in this particular case, uh, using that female attractive nature, and the Lord could have came in any other form, but he took that particular form because he knew it would be the most effective for the demons. And he stole, he got the nectar back. Of course, Rahu, he figured it out. And, and he tried to get a little bit, but he got his head cut off. And by the sun and the moon, they 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 they, uh, they said, "Well, this person is not a demigod; he's a demon, and he's coming to get the nectar." And so Krishna, through his Sudarshan chakra, and gave him a haircut, just below the neck there. So, and his head floated around and became a planet, which we know as the Rahu planet, and that's the. Uh, and then sometimes we have this, what is it called? Uh, eclipse, yeah. So Rahu comes in front of the sun and the moon because he's attacking the sun and the moon. So an eclipse is Rahu's head, now a, a, an actual planet, because he drank that nectar and the nectar got, to, got this far. His rest of the body was destroyed, but his head remained immortal because he was able to get the nectar. So that planet, yes. and they say that's, that these eclipses, the solar eclipse and lunar eclipse, are very inauspicious. And you see, people in the West, they don't know, but uh, in India, I'm, sometimes I'm in India when they have an eclipse and everything stops. People go to start worshiping the Lord. They go down to the sacred rivers and bathe during the eclipse. Nobody cooks and nobody eats during the eclipse. <laughs> Because if you say if you cook during the eclipse and then someone eats that food, it becomes inauspicious, becomes poison. <laughs> so yeah, so this um, the eclipses are considered to be very inauspicious, <laughs> and it's it's you know it's a, it's a planet, it's a it's a very low planet. Now, but Shiva, he's um, he's um, he's curious. He wants to see this beautiful form of the Lord. I remember I was giving a class in in Chaupati in Bombay Radad Radagopinath Temple and one brahmachari he said uh, should we create a form of mimohini murti for worship in our temples <laughs> that was the question I got in in the class <laughs> Kind of a tough question. <laughs> so, 
Well, I, I, I said, uh, I think there will be no brahmacharis left after <laughs> that form was created. <laughs> and uh, Radha Swami was there and he was laughing, so <laughs> I thought it was a good answer. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so there would be no brahmacharis left. So he said, he said, should we ask the GBC to authorize that form of worship? And I was thinking, forget it, you know. <laughs> Just read about it, that's all. <laughs> because it's dangerous. Yeah. yeah. And it says that many of the great conquerors in the world, they can conquer nations, but when they're alone with their beautiful wife or, or consort, they're conquered. <laughs> so... Who's stronger, a man or a woman? Well, the women have more attractive power, and therefore her man becomes something to have. That's why it says, uh, the association in woman and man is like butter and fire. <laughs> and who's the fire? Mataji. And you become the butter, and then all of a sudden you're all over the floor, you know. You're melted. <laughs> So Krishna has created this female form in order for us to somehow or other think there's some happiness in this world. <laughs> and so, you know, and somebody, sometimes devotees think, I'm fixed. <laughs> Nothing can attract me. <laughs> I remember it was one devotee, he was... He was chanting Japa in one temple. And he was just chanting, chanting Japa. And this beautiful girl came, it was in Croatia actually. <laughs> she walked in the door and he dropped his beads. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then I think he forgot what round he was on. <laughs> Maybe he didn't care either, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, sometimes, you know, so Krishna can, can create, sometimes you think, well, you know, I mean, I'm not going to be bothered by that. I'm fixed in my Krishna consciousness. Good luck. <laughs> Look what happened to Lord Shiva. Of course, that was Krishna. But there's always some female in the world that can bewilder you, so don't think you are so fixed in Krishna consciousness. That's the power of the opposite sex, and that's why it was created, in order to keep the living entities situated in the material world. Pumsam strina mituni bhava metan tayor rivata augati ahur atogriha shetar sutapta vatayam janasa moham yamaham mameti. Rishabdave recites this verse. The basic principle of material life is the attraction between male and female. And then he says, based on this misconception, he doesn't say conception, he says misconception, the hearts of these two could tie together, and then atogriha shetra sutapta vitayar, then you have home, you have children, you have land, you have response, and it is, and jasamoham yamahamma meti, these are the, the eye and mind principles. This is my wife, this is my house, these are my kids. They look like me, so they must be my kids. <laughs> Maybe they look more like my wife. <laughs> so, you know, you go through this whole I and mind thing, and then that, that is, that is uh, a humma meti, that is the entanglement in the material world. So if one can break the attachment between, for attraction to the opposite sex, there's only one way you can do that. Only one. You may be the greatest philosopher. You may be the greatest transcendentalist. You may be the greatest. There's only one way you can break that attraction. You have to get more attracted to Krishna. That's the only way. Your philosophy, all of your, you know, intelligence, all of your determination cannot break that attraction. It's too strong. <laughs> Only when one gets attracted to Krishna can then one can overcome the attraction to the opposite sex. 
just like sometimes, and I've seen it in temples. <clears throat> it happens everywhere. There's one brahmachari in the temple, and what the Mataji, and she's, you know, she's got, mm, she's got the binoculars on him, you know. She's zeroed him in. This is the one I'm going to get. <clears throat> and then she goes before the deity and prays, my dear Lord, this will be my perfect husband, and you are the most wonderful person. <clears throat> you can fulfill all desires, and so this is my desire. My obeisances. <laughs> <clears throat> and I, I saw it in New and there was one girl, she was coming there every day in front of the deities crying and she wanted this. He was the best of all the brahmacharis in the temple. <clears throat> and, and he was the leader of the brahmacharis, in fact. And he was like really good looking guy, very intelligent, but very fixed in his Krishna consciousness. And she was really determined to get him really determined to get him. And she was, you know, I think she tried every prayer that's in the Shastra. <laughs> she was really determined. Because when women get determined to get a man, be careful. <laughs> they are good. They can do it. So, uh, so uh, he was a little affected by that and he found out. So he decided to make an experiment to see what Krishna wanted. And so we had this lake, we made a man-made lake in Nubrindava, and it was just across the way. And it was a pretty good-sized lake. It was man-made, we filled it with water. And sometimes devotees would go swimming there. And we had a raft, you know what a raft is? In the middle of the lake. So he decided to make an experiment to see whether he should get married or not. <laughs> this is an interesting experiment. He, he, he decided to lay on the raft at the time of going to rest at night. <clears throat> and then, if he woke up on the western side, he would get married. And if he woke up on the eastern side of the lake, he would stay brahmachari. True story. <laughs> So he took rest, lay down on the raft, and then, of course, you know, there's always the movement of the water. So the move, the water would, and so he woke up, and it was on the eastern side, the Brahmachari side, but it was two o'clock in the morning when he woke up, and he thought, "Wow, it's the eastern side, but I don't get up this early." <laughs> So he went back to sleep. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> swaha. Swaha. Throw your grains. Swaha. <laughs> and so he, he wound up on the western side, and there, there was shortly after that the wedding bells were ringing. So <laughs> Forget what we get for oversleeping. <laughs> <laughs> this is a true story. I'm not making this. Is, this is details are actually this is what happened. And he married a very nice girl, a very nice girl, and they had a nice child. And their marriage was very successful. Actually, it was a very good Krishna conscious marriage. And uh, but then again, you you come to the point: <clears throat> if a woman wants a man. And the man doesn't want the woman, who wins? <laughs> Here, I'll tell you the secret now. There's a way of ascertaining that. If the woman wants the man more than the man wants Krishna, she wins. And if the man wants Krishna more than the woman wants him, he wins. Okay? Write that down. <laughs> So ladies, you can juice up your energy levels and see if you can uh, increase and then the men can become more Krishna conscious and then everything will be better. <laughs> so anyway, that's pretty much the situation. 
Mohini Murti, I mean, when the Lord is beautiful in all his forms, but when he becomes a woman, Lord Shiva is dearer. He is the personification of being unaffected by anything material. In fact, <clears throat> young girls worship the Shiva Linga to get a good husband. Shiva is the person where ladies, this is all over India, they still do that, they worship the Linga of Shiva for a husband. And there was one time where Parvati was worshiping the genitals of Shiva, and Shiva was completely dira, not phased in the slightest, completely fixed in his consciousness. Oh, I'm getting a little action back there. I hope I'm not disturbing the Pajaris here. <laughs> Jai, Shishi Panchatattva Ki Jai. There's no Mohini Murti Didi on the altar yet. Okay. <laughs> so, and, G, and so he's, and Shiva, Parvati's worshipping the, the Prabhupada talks about the, the genitals of Shiva. He's fixed. He's not slightly, not even the slightest movement of his consciousness, he's absorbed. But when it came to Mohini Murti, you read the story. Krishna is all attractive and in his female form, watch out. <laughs> so when that devotee in Chaupati asked me if we should make deities of Mohini Murti for the temples, I thought, no, <laughs> better not. So, so you see, in Krishna's all attractive form is so powerful that no one can resist. And Shiva is the king of the, those who are unaffected by material energy. He is the best in that category. Even Lord Brahma, Lord Brahma got attracted by his daughter, apparently. Of course, we should not find fault with Lord Brahma. But he, got, he chased after his daughter, Vak. It's mentioned in the third canto. And because of that, he's a powerful demigod. He's fixed. He's the controller of the universe. He's just, and he even creates the bodies. He was somehow mentions he was attracted by his daughter. And then he had to give up that body of Lord Brahma. And that body became fog. Just like the other day when we had... I was noticing there was some fog. We were in Croatia, actually, and there was fog all over. So one devotee asked me about fog. I said, fog is actually sex desire. <laughs> because fog was created from the body of Lord Brahma. So when there's increased in sex desire in the energy, the atmosphere becomes foggy. <laughs> yeah. And that's the body of Lord Brahma when he gave it up because of having a, a wrong attitude towards his, uh, towards his own daughter. Like that. But Prabhupada said, be careful, don't find fault with Lord Shiva or Lord Brahma for being attracted in that way. He said, Prabhupada says, these particular pastimes of Brahma and Shiva being attracted for the female form are for you. Don't ever think you're so fixed in your Krishna consciousness that you can never be attracted. Hmm. That's why the Shastras say one should not be alone with their mother, a, a brahmachari, or a man should not be alone with his mother, his sister, or his daughter. Yeah. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, <clears throat> he's, I mean, he's one of the most powerful acharyas. He was with a group of his disciples. And one of his disciples' daughter was there. So she was a young girl and he was an elderly man. And she said, Guru Maharaj, I would like to speak with you. He said, yes, you can speak. She said, no, no, I would like to speak in private. He said, I'm sorry. If you want to speak something, you can speak here. <laughs> He wouldn't even go in private with the daughter of one of his disciples who was just like his own granddaughter. She was, you know. So he set the example, and Prabhupada also like that. <laughs> Prabhupada also. 
was very strict in this uh, category. And so, uh, so that helps to keep the proper atmosphere or the mood in the temples like that. So association with the opposite sex should only be done for the sake of executing devotional service and only a limited amount of time, not like we expend so much time in that association. Because the senses, <clears throat> the senses are like servants or serpents. The seven senses can jump any time. We have the example of Subari Muni. <clears throat> so Subari Muni was was meditating underwater. He was a great Muni. He was very powerful. All of a sudden, he saw two two fishes engaging in sex activity in the water. He became disturbed by that. And because of that, he gave up his, his position as a Muni, and he got married. He married 50 girls, actually. <laughs> he had 50 wives. And that's a whole story. That's mentioned in the ninth canto. You'll come to that particular pastime. So this attraction to the opposite sex is so powerful that it's the, it's the strongest force in the material world. So that's why the word woman in the Bhagavatam, when the, when the word woman is used, it does not necessarily mean female. When you hear the, see the word woman, it does not mean female, it means opposite sex. So the scriptures say, for a man, woman is woman, and for a woman, man is woman. <laughs> that's how it's understood, like that. Anyway, we have to get become more and more fixed in our attraction to Krishna. As we develop our attraction for Krishna, then the attraction for the material energy becomes less and less and less. And then you have the example of Srila Haridas Thakur. I mean, he was approached in the dead of night by a prostitute. And she was the most qualified and most attractive prostitute in the whole area. She was famous. She was rich because she had attracted so many persons. She was living the life of luxury. So she was commissioned by one envious governor to make Haridas fall down. And she came in the dead of night. <clears throat> and Haridas was there. And she sat down and she started to exhibit some of her female expressions. And she said, oh, Haridas, you are such a beautiful man. And I am also very qualified. I think us coming together is by the will of providence. <laughs> he said, yes, I accept. And I think what you say is correct. But I have my japa to do. I have made a vow to chant uh, so many rounds every month, and I have not finished my, my japa. So please be patient, and I will chant, and then when I'm finished my japa, I will satisfy your desire. So she sat there, and he was chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. And then it became midnight, and he said, oh, you're still here. Oh, I haven't finished my rounds yet. Please come back tomorrow, and I surely will finish, satisfy your desire. So she left. Same scenario. Second night, again. He said, I'm sorry. Please, tomorrow. When she came back for the third time, and she was sitting there, and he was chanting, she had been listening to the Maha Mantra all this time, and she became purified. And then, then she started to cry, fell at the feet of Haridas, explained why she had come. And Haridas said, I knew you were coming, but I could have left this place, because I know that rascal governor, you know, Ramachandra Khan, he is out to to destroy me, but I wanted to deliver you, so I stayed. <laughs> <laughs>
And she actually became a devotee. She said, I am your disciple, please instruct me. He said, go home, take all of your wealth, give it to all of the brahmanas, put on a white dress, come here and worship Tulsi Devi and chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And she was also chanting 333,333 names of God. That's the power of the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So that's Hari Das Thakur. <laughs> so one god brother of mine, he told me, he actually said this in a class. He was giving a class and I was there. He said, one of my disciples got a call from his ex-girlfriend and she said, I want to meet you. And he was thinking, you know, I don't really want to meet her, but... Anyway, maybe I can be like Haridas, I can deliver her. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she came in the evening time and he was there and he was just you know, like chanting Hare Krishna and she was there like that. And so it went through the whole night and I don't know how long it lasted, but it was as he explains it. <laughs> and then he came and he told his guru, you know, I didn't fall down. I was okay. He said, you fool, you fell down in the mine how many times? <laughs> Your mind was disturbed. So, yeah, uh, sometimes we think, well, I, you know, nothing happened. But then if the mind is changed, and if it gets too changed, then it's very hard again to regain your Krishna consciousness. <laughs> Though so there is mental fall down also, which can lead, when it gets strong enough, it'll lead to actual uh, physical actions. So one should be very careful to keep the mind fixed on the lotus feet of the Lord in devotional service, because material energy is very, very, very powerful. Prabhupada used to chastise us. He would say to us, Western devotees, you do not fear Maya enough. That is your problem. He said, you, don't, you do not have a healthy fear of Maya. It's because of that. So, I mean, we have the history of our movement, 40 sannyasis that were made by Krishna. Prabhupada made 53 sannyasis. 40 of them fell back into material life again. That's a high percentage. <laughs> And so, yeah, so one should not play around with the material energy and think, I'm so strong that I can be, you know. So one should be respectful. One should not have a, a hatred towards the opposite sex. That is also a type of attachment, too. Aversion and attachment is also attachment, but in an opposite way. So in order to overcome that, one has to be one has to make advancement in Krishna consciousness and one has to follow very carefully the etiquette for proper association. And if we do that, we'll always be in the best position like that. We give respects, just like Prabhupada used to say, we should always refer to women as mataji. Even if they're young, still, they are be, should be called mataji or mother, like that. And then one, one lady, she was at, at Prabhupada's lecture when he mentioned that. And so she asked, well, yes, but what should women refer to men as? And Prabhupada said, son. <laughs> son. So that way it keeps it away from the sensual mood like that. So uh, yeah, so this is um, the history of our movement is not being care careful in these types of association. So one should be very careful. And never, one should never think, I'm, you know, I'm like Lord Shiva, or maybe even better, I'm like Hari Das Thakur. I'm, uh, I'm fixed. <clears throat> no, Maya is very, very strong. So one, one can always overcome the power of Maya only by the power of one's devotional service. Therefore, one has to develop attraction for Krishna in such a way that that attraction becomes the only attraction. 
And that can be done by hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, by worshiping the Lord, by offering beautiful prayers to the Lord, by serving the Lord. All of these things increase the attraction for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. <clears throat> okay, any questions or comments? <laughs> Yes. Thank you, Guru Maharaj, for a very sobering lecture. Um, I was thinking that, you know, the Shastras say how woman, you know, attraction to a man, calling fall down, this, that, isn't the opposite yeah. also true yeah. for a woman who's serious about spiritual life? Yeah. yeah. For her, she also has to be very careful yes. Yes. not to... Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, that distraction is, it's a, it's a, it's understood in both both ways. Yeah, completely. Yeah. <laughs> and my second question is, um, in ISKCON, um, do we have women sannyasis? Are women allowed to become sannyasis? Um, that is against scripture. But women have a thing called what they call it. They take what they call vanaprast, and they put on white. <clears throat> So when a woman is no longer uh, connected with anything of the family anymore, and they they have re developed a sense of renunciation, and with approval from the authorities, and usually their spiritual master, they can put on white. And generally what happens, they go to a holy place, and then serve in that holy place, and finish their life out leave their body in that holy place, worshiping the deity there, and then they have an, an easy and more, uh, what we say, a greater chance to go back home, back to Godhead, like that. So yeah, there's a formula for women also to take a type of renunciation. That means putting on white. So when you see a woman wearing white, you mean, generally, she is like a sannyasi in that sense. But Thank the formal sannyas, because sannyas means to travel and preach. So we don't usually give that order to a woman because then she would have to go out and travel and preach. You know, that's the definition of sannyas. <clears throat> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I, my question first. My okay, question. so you were you were speaking about this uh, this experiment that this uh, that this brahmachari made. Yeah. Um, so, so isn't it, it, there's a better way? You know, I, I heard that in Shri Sampradaya, they for sannyasis that were for sure they were checking his his uh, his birth. You know, his his chart, right. and he, if he was not. Uh, he was not in, in, in line with this. He just, they just didn't give him sannyas or something. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean for us? So how can we check, uh, we can check also our, I mean, our chart? Yeah, the, the tendencies are there, but tendencies are not powerful enough to overcome the force of maya. Yeah, there are certain devotees who have certain astrological alignments at the time of birth. And they have a tendency for one way or the other. Like, there are, I can give you, there are three types of brahmacharis. There's one that will not stay brahmachari. They'll get married. <laughs> and all the women can see it. Ah, he's a brahmachari. <laughs> They're just laughing because they know that he's not a brahmachari. Because they can see that. Women can see it really easy. And then there's another one who is, that is a real brahmachari. They'll stay brahmachari for life or they may even take stanyas. And then you have the third who is, can go either way. Can either go towards grihasta life or stay in brahmachari life. And that depends on the association and the training they get in their Krishna consciousness. So you have those three possibilities in the Brahmacharya Ashram, those three. So 
generally we give training to the brahmacharis to see if the, the, those who who already have that tendency can become strong and fixed and then, then we give training to those who could go either way to give them an opportunity to stay in the brahmachari ashram. But even with the training, you might see some brahmacharis will not stay even because they have the training like that. Like that. Yes, but there is astrological considerations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there are some questions. But, but that's not the whole. The training and the association is really the foundation for determining what direction a person will go in Krishna consciousness. Mm-hmm. And that's why we say that the brahmacharis should be educated in scripture. They should be able to give classes, like in some temples, all the brahmacharis are trained in education, and every brahmachari in the temple can give a class. <laughs> and that's important. Brahmacharis should be trained in that. So they, so when they, once they're fixed in the philosophy, and there's generally they're, they're stronger in their ashram. <laughs> yeah. Yes, okay. And you have a question from the yes from the, the barrel. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, Avadutarai is uh, is asking. So the second offense to the holy name has two explanations: to consider Shiva equal to Lord Vishnu, and as per Brihad Bhagavatamrita, to consider Shiva different from Vishnu is also an offense. So the question: so whatever we think equal or not equal, we will always make an offense to the holy name. No, you should take that ten offenses, but we should understand that you should take that the that Ishwar Parma Krishna Satchidananda Vigraha Anadi Radhe Govind Krishna is the Adi Purusha. He is the source. So there are certain qualities in Krishna that are not there in any of the other manifestations. He is the original Adi. So from that point of view, there is no you say less. Equality, and then it's also mentioned in the uh, Brahma Samhita. And just like if you take milk and you add a, a culture to it, you get yogurt. So what is yogurt? It's nothing but milk. It's nothing but milk. There's only, but still, it's different from milk. You can't use yogurt like you use milk. So in the same way. Shiva and Krishna are non-different, but they're also different. <laughs> and that's the verse. What is that verse from the Brahma Samhita? Anybody know? Uh, yeah. Anybody know that verse from Brahma Samhita? Uh, I, I can't, if I remember the first word, I can understand. Chiran, Chiran, yeah, it's uh, shiram, where the word yogurt is there. So yeah, so we should uh, we should take that seriously. The second offense to the holy name, that to consider Shiva to be on the same level as Vishnu, and that the statement in the Brihad Bhagavatam Rita is not any less important, but the 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 statement in the the Brahma Samhita gives the clarity that there is there is a distinction there. Shiva is a demigod. Vishnu is also a demigod. He plays the role of a demigod, but he is he is the actually the source of the demigods also. So you in, in order to verify a particular point you have to bring in many of the scriptures. And what is the superior scripture that gives the, the complete understanding? Just like in many scriptures, it says that Agni is the Supreme Lord. In some scriptures, it says Shiva is the Supreme Lord. In other scriptures, yeah, these two are mentioned. But they are mentioned for people who can't come to the stage of worshiping Krishna in devotion. So they can worship these demigods as the Supreme, and then they will make advancement in that way. Okay. 
So when you put together all of the different, you have to come to the understanding, the highest understanding. Therefore, Srimad Bhagavatam gives the highest understanding. <laughs> if there's any contradiction, an apparent contradiction. And the contradictions appear because of different situations, not because of contradiction. In one situation, they're equal, in another situation, they're not equal. But the ultimate principle is Krishna's Adi Purusha. He is the Sunam Bonam. He is the manifestation of all of the manif incarnations, demigods and everything. And Shiva is really an expansion of Lord Vishnu. <laughs> And the, the example in the Bhagavatam is the story of Rikrasura. When Shiva gave that demon a benediction, and then the demon wanted the benediction and anybody's head he touched would, would crack. So Shiva gave the benediction because he's asutos, he's easily pleased. And, of course, he's also easily angered. And so now this demon has this power. He wants Parvati for his concert. So he chases after Shiva to touch his head. Shiva runs. You'll see it in the end of the 10th canto. It's mentioned. It's also mentioned in Krishna book. She was fleeing from this demon who was chasing after him. And what happens? He runs past Lord Vishnu. And Lord Vishnu sees that Shiva's in trouble. And so he takes the form of a little boy and, and stops the demon. What are you doing? Well, I got this benediction from Lord Shiva. Anybody's head I touch will crack and I'm going to touch his head. Vishnu says, in the form of a boy, he says, Lord Shiva has not been well lately. He's giving out benedictions that don't work. <laughs> Just touch your own head and you'll see it doesn't work. <laughs> So using what we call Vishnu Maya, he bewilders the demon, he touches his own head and he cracks and he dies. So that story in the Bhagavatam gives the indication who's more powerful, Shiva or Vishnu. So when we have a contention, we go to that story and see how Shiva was saved by Vishnu. He couldn't save himself apparently. And there's another story in Ramanujacharya's pastime where there was one deity they were worshipping. And some of the worshippers saying, it's a deity of Shiva. And others were saying, it's a deity of Vishnu. And so they were arguing with it. So they made an experiment. Is it Shiva or is it Vishnu? So what they did, they took the symbols of Vishnu and, and the symbols of Shiva and placed it in front of the deity and then closed the deity door that night. And they said, the next morning, we will see which shim symbols the deity picks up. <laughs> so they prayed to the deity to please help us. So the next morning when the deity was revealed, he was holding the symbols of Vishnu. <laughs> like that. So yeah, so there are many incidents in the Shastras to show that Shiva is simply subordinate to Vishnu and we should accept it that way. That's why that verse from the second, the second verse from the offenses is to consider demigods like Lord Shiva and Lord Vishnu to be on the same, equal to or greater than Lord Vishnu is considered an offense. Mm -hmm. So we have many examples. <laughs> Okay, is there anything else? Mm -hmm. Another question, same person? Um, it, how can we know um, that rejection is not the other side of attachment? Well, out of the two, <clears throat> because when you're averse to something, you are attract, attracted to something else. That's the nature of the material world, is the world is duality. Wherever there's attraction, there's aversion. Wherever there's aversion, there's attraction. 
So Krishna consciousness means to be above both attraction and aversion. A Krishna conscious person will see the material energy for what it is. It's Krishna's energy. Doesn't have any attraction for it, doesn't have any aversion towards it. But out of the two, in order to preserve our Krishna consciousness, sometimes we develop an aversion. But that is in the beginning, just to help us not to fall victim to an attraction. But in that, you can't stay in that aversion mentality because it again will cause attraction. So that's good in the beginning until you get, they say, fixed in Krishna consciousness and you're supposed to be above aversion and attraction like that. Then that's Krishna consciousness. It's called dhira. That's one of the qualities of a devotee. He's not moved by happiness and distress. Mm -hmm not attracted or reversed. He sees the material energy for what it is. It's Krishna's energy. And it's working in a certain way. That's all. Mm -hmm. is, is that all right? Yes, Maharaj. That's... Ask him if both of those answers that I gave was satisfactory. <laughs> I think he's on, he's, he's on. Uh, uh, he's hearing, but is he satisfied? He didn't, he didn't say. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we can't tell, so we just give the answer. Okay, so thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Mohini Murti Ki Jai, <laughs> Lord Shiva Ki Jai, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, the all-attractive Supreme Personality of Godhead Sri Krishna in his Vrindavan form Ki Jai. <laughs>